Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our live webinar on encapsulation. My name is Andre Broadcorp. Uh, I'm a researcher here at the Chagas Food Research Center in Moore Park here in Fermoy in Ireland. This is one of our first webinars in a long row of webinars on encapsulation. And today's topic is on complex coacervation. And I have, um, I would like to uh, introduce our co-host, uh, Mariana Dragosavak, and our two presenters, Daniel uh, Miramonte Suyaga and Sandra Heinert. If you can show yourself, please. So Hi. here we are. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is a live webinar on Zoom, but we also live stream on uh, uh, YouTube. Um, and you can, of course, see the uh, uh, webinar afterwards. I just want to start with a, a short introduction of the webinar and what we are doing. Here we go. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So the organizer of this uh, webinar is um, uh, the Bioencapsulation Research Group and an EU project uh, called NCAP for Health. It is a multi-partner EU project with partners from uh, uh, Europe and Latin America, and also academic and industry partners all around encapsulation. And two of the speakers, uh, two of the um, um, secondis that spend time abroad uh, will be presenting their results here. So I mentioned the NCAP for Health uh, project, but of course we have um, the bioencapsulation research group here as well. And the BRG has already organized many, many conferences, training schools and industrial conventions. At the moment, uh, there is a bit of a change. So our main channel of communication is the LinkedIn group uh, called Microencapsulation. So you just go to LinkedIn, uh, type Microencapsulation and follow follow us. And of course, we have a YouTube channel, it's Bioencapsulation and Microencapsulation. And I have the uh, QR code for the LinkedIn group and for the YouTube channel here on the left-hand side. Okay, so without any further delay, I would like to introduce our first speaker, and that's Sandra Heinert. Uh, we are happy to have you, uh, have you here. The, the uh, webinar is recorded. Uh, Sandra is a graduate from the uh, Technical University in Berlin, and since 2017, she's working with the good people of Simrise in Holzminden in Germany, and her, um, uh, her specialty is encapsulation of flavors in a particular spray drying. So I will start the uh, Sandra's talk. It uh, has been recorded. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you see a Q&A button. So if you want to introduce, if you have any question, would be great if you type it during the talk. Okay, so we have a bit of time to, uh, um, to review it. Okay, here we go, Sandra. Over to you. Hello, everybody, and also welcome from my side to this webinar. Thank you, Andre, for the kind introduction. Today, I'd like to talk about spray drying of coatsuvates, especially the risks of spray drying of coatsuvates in general, but also made from plant-based material. But first of all, I'd like to thank all contributors for their great work. This project is part of a really great project called NCAP for Health, which is funded by the European Union. And within this project, innovative concepts for biopolymer-based microcapsules are developed um, during a huge knowledge exchange with 12 participating institutes. So feel free to check their website for further information. Let me start with the question, why is encapsulation of flavors or active ingredients so important? Well, by encapsulation, we can optimize the application as well as the handling. And the main point for us is, of course, to extend the shelf life by protecting the flavor from undesired oxidative reactions and therefore preserve the taste profile. And when encapsulation efficiency is bad, core material will reach the surface of the capsule and cause such undesired reactions. 
um, we are able with um, different encapsulation technologies to control um, the particle size, but also the release of flavors. And by entrapping the flavor in a carrier material, handling and safety are improved. And of course, on the other side, there are also some challenges finding the correct encapsulation method. Um, but here I'd like to highlight just um, a few points, namely that processes are often very harsh. So the capsules have to be stable to survive these processes. And um, the most <clears throat> processes deliver water-soluble capsules. Um, but for some application, it is never necessary to have insoluble ones. And therefore, we could use complex coservation. So let me explain it to you very shortly. We have three phases, an overload of water, the core material, and two oppositely charged polymers, which are mixed. In this research, this was done by stirring in a vessel. And with the stir speed, you can directly adjust the particle size or the droplet size of the core material. In a second step, after changing the pH to a specific value, um, the polymers are attracted to each other and form an insoluble shell around the core material. The so-built coating is then solidified by cross-linking, for example, with tannic acid. A common disadvantage of um, this method is the high water content, making the, um, the coat so it's prone to microbiological spoilage. But an efficient method to overcome this disadvantage and to obtain a microcapsules in a powdered form, for example, for the further um, application, is spray drying. And I'd like to go with you through the process of spray drying because the process parameters play an important role in this project. So in general, the process starts with the production of a stable emulsion made from core material, um, emulsifier, some carrier material like maltodextrin and water. In our case, these are the coats weights. The emulsion or suspension, from now on we call it slurry, is then pumped at specific flow rates to um, the top of a spray dryer where it is atomized. There are three different atomization systems which can be used, um, rotary disks, pressure nozzles or two fluid nozzles, and for these experiments, we used two fluid nozzles where air at specific pressures is used for the atomization of the liquid. The liquid insert of the nozzle or in the nozzle is available in different diameter sizes. So with these three parameters, nozzle size, feed flow rate and air pressure, you can directly influence the particle structure. So keep that in mind. Um, after atomization, the fine emulsion droplets get in contact with heated air, which is around 150 to 200 degrees. And therefore, water is evaporated um, first from the surface of the droplet and then from the inside out. Um, when reaching the cyclone, the powdered particles are separated from the exhaust air with some fine dust. So the particles now are dry and um, several oil droplets are entrapped within the carrier material, which you can see here or here. Now we come back to the core. So weights. spray drying of these might be also quite challenging because the core shell ratio is really high, which means we have a very thin ball or shell compared to the core material and the mentioned steps of pumping, atomizing and drying might destroy these thin walls and even small defects in the shell like you can see here in this picture could lead to leaking of the active ingredient and therefore increasing the surface oil which is then prone to undesired reactions. And one can also imagine that big particles get disrupted more easily than smaller ones like this here. And coming to um, coatsuates with gel structure, these hydrogels entrap a lot of water, which also has to be removed without destroying the structure. And in addition, brittle dry gels might be very sensitive to mechanical forces. And as these effects are not well studied, 
This research aims to investigate the critical effects of spray drying of coesivates to ensure a stable product at the end. So for the coesivation process, we varied the initial oil droplet size to around 50 and 120 microns. And at some point we changed the core shell ratio, but we come back to that later. Afterwards, the coesivates were spray dried. We used a small spray tower uh, with an evaporation capacity of around 3 kg per hour. The inlet temperature was kept constant at 200 degrees for all experiments. As liquid insert, we used 1, 1.5 and 2 millimeters. We used two different feed, feed flow rates, let's say a moderate one and a faster one, um, because it's always nice for the industry to increase capacity and therefore reduce drying time. And furthermore, the atomizing air pressure was varied from one to three bars. So we have therefore a difference um, in the shear which affects the liquid during atomization. Afterwards, the products were characterized in terms of surface oil of the spread rate product and particle size distribution of the re-diluted powder. This was compared to the initial slurry to see if there are any changes in distribution and uh, with that surface oil and particle size distribution we have some indicators um, for breakage of coats of all experiments we took microscope pictures and there are some elasticity measurements ongoing first of all this was done with a commonly used reference system made from gelatin and gum arabic um, to have kind of a model system and this was converted into a plant-based system with potato, protein, and citrus pectin. In both cases, we used MCT oil as core material, and the coelser weights were cross-linked with tannic acid. Let's now have a look at the following results. We start with the gelatin system with a D50 of 50 microns sprayed right with a two millimeter nozzle. And based on this slide, I'd like to go with you through the structure as the following slides have a similar arrangement. So in the upper left hand corner, you can always see a microscope picture of the coelserate slurry before drying. And uh, what you can see uh, in this case is that the coelserates produced with the stirring method um, are polydispersed, which means that we have some bigger coelserates, but also some smaller ones. This bar chart shows the measured surface oil of the dried coats away its independency of the um, applied atomization pressure at low feed flow rate. And the last bar reflects high pressure at high feed flow rate. What we can see is that the surface oil increases with increasing air pressure from one to three bar as higher mechanical forces lead to a stronger disruption of the coats away. Um, but when you look at the last bar on the chart, where the feed flow rate is increased at high pressure, the surface oil is less again. Um, this might be because less force is acting on the individual coats of weights. In the bottom, we can see the particle size distribution of the re-diluted samples in comparison to the initial slurry, which is shown in red. I don't want to go through all the individual results, but the key here is that for all samples, we can see um, a slight shift to the left, which indicates that in particular, bigger coarser weights are destroyed during the process. But sometimes big particles are required in terms of mouthfeel or certain release properties. And therefore, we produced also bigger coats of weights with the D50 around 120 microns. In this and the next slides, I focus on just specific parameter combinations for two different nozzle sizes, um, 1.5 and 2 millimeter, because um, one millimeter showed two bad results. So we have um, 1.5 bar and 3 bar at um, small feed flow rate and three bar also at high feed flow rate respectively. Yeah, and from the results before, this is not uh, super surprising when looking at the level of the surface oil, one can directly see that 
um, it is with 30 to 50 percent much higher than for the smaller code surveys. Looking at the effect of the nozzle size, we see on the one hand that surface oil has a slightly higher level for the um, smaller size and also the particle size distribution shows that for 1.5 millimeter a change in parameters has um, a stronger effect than for the 2 millimeter nozzle. And to mention one more point, surface oil can be reduced again by increasing the feed flow rate. But um, yeah, at the end, uh, most of the big coats of weights um, were destroyed during, during the spray drying process, which we can see um, because of the high surface oil content and the shift in distribution. But how can we stabilize these big particles or these big coats of weights during spray drying if they are required by the customer? As in general, smaller Kaushal ratios deliver a better protection. The Kaushal ratio was changed, which led to a thicker shell around the oil droplet, which you can clearly see here in the microscope picture. And yeah, the um, thicker shell protected the encapsulated material against shear forces quite good, which we can see at the surface oil. We reached small levels down to 11%, similar to that of the small cohort weights, but not at harsh conditions like um, 1.5 millimeters and 3 bar, which can also be seen in the particle size distribution. And in this microscope picture, you can clearly see the deformation of the cohort weights. Let me briefly summarize what I've said so far. For the gelatine system, we were able to see that bigger cohort weights are more prone to mechanical forces in comparison to small cohort weights. But this could be combated by increasing the thickness of the shell and also using a bigger nozzle size with high flow rates could lead to less surface oil or um, less breakage. And nowadays and in the future, we will always have to deal with the request for plant based materials. And this is why we also wanted to check the stability of a plant, completely plant based um, system for coercivation. For the plant based system, it's much more difficult to see um, the shell because there is no real gel structure. And this is why we dyed the pectin with ruthenium red to make uh, the shell slightly visible. The effect of um, the used spray drying parameters on the surface oil of the dried particles is comparable to the gelatine system. There is a shift in the particle size distribution, but um, comparing the results with each other, they seem less prone to changes in the um, drying parameters. As we learned so far, the properties of the shell have a massive impact on the stability and therefore we added calcium chloride in order to have a certain gelation of the pectin and this worked indeed. The surface oil decreased significantly for the samples with calcium shown in the light green bars, which is even less um, compared to the gelatin system. And also for the plant-based system, we wanted to check if the big particles are the most unstable ones. And yes, looking at the surface oil, it seems that big particles are more unstable against mechanical forces as the surface oil level here is higher than for the small 50 micron uh, coats of weights, which was between um, 30 and 25%. Also, the particle size distribution shows that there is a clear shift um, to smaller particles um, in comparison to the slurry, um, which also indicates that there had to be some breakage of um, the coats of weights during spray drying. And the addition of calcium also led here to uh, reduce surface oil levels and stabilized the big particles slightly, which you can also observe in the smaller shift in the particle size distribution. Um, yeah, it seems that the shell is more robust against mechanical stress when calcium is added. 
We also did a few um, rheological measurements, which I want to show you here really quickly within the tested concentrations, which are less than in the co process, but the ratios were kept the same. The addition of calcium results in higher G prime, indicating a more elastic behavior, which probably prevents co from disruption during spray drying. And on the right-hand side, um, I just want to highlight that this is the comparison between the plant-based system in green um, with the gelatin system in orange. And for the plant-based system, G prime and G double prime are higher cost to develop a tighter coasoid structure, for example. Um, but rheological measurements are still ongoing. Before I come to the end of my presentation, let me go over the key issues here again. In terms of coats of weights, the tested plant-based coats of weights reach surface oil levels similar or even lower than the commonly used gelatin gamma arabic system, and they were less prone to changes in spray drying parameters. We saw that the bigger the coats of weights are, the higher is the risk of disruption. And I mentioned at one point that we created polydispersed um, coats of weights, but having monodispersed coats of weights with a specific particle size might help finding the real critical size at which um, the coats of weights break during spray drying. And this could be done with membrane emulsification. And the following presentation is about this issue. So if you're interested in, please keep watching. And furthermore, um, the shell properties and the thickness have a huge effect on the stability. And also the elasticity of the shell could protect the coats of weights against shear forces. Regarding the spray drying parameters, we saw that with a two millimeter nozzle insert, less coats of weights were destroyed. This might be due to a more gently droplet demolition at the nozzle. And we saw that with increasing atomization air pressure, the surface oil of the dried coats of weights increased. But when we have high pressure and high feed flow rate, the surface oil was less again. But please don't come up with the idea using a large nozzle size, low pressure, and high feed flow rates because these three parameters are not independent of each other if you want to have a dry product at the end. But now we understand better which screws we have to turn to get desired properties while spray drying coats of weights. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm also very thankful to be part of the NCAP for Health project and the opportunity which was given to me. And now I'll be happy to answer any questions or discussion points you may have. Wonderful. So uh, thank you, Sandra, for this um, nice presentation. Uh, if anyone has any questions to ask, please type the questions to the bottom right of your screen. We will answer all of the questions uh, following the second presentation as well. But before we follow, I would kind of have a question maybe for Sandra uh, to allow preparations for the second presentation. Um, it, it's quite interesting uh, that you're dealing with the spray drawing as a technique to manufacture the cost surveys. So I was just wondering um, when it gets to the selection of the materials, how a selection of a type of um, um, uh, gamma arabic makes a, a difference and also what are the scalable uh, opportunities and uh, at which scale you can operate when you do the spray drawing. Um, yeah, so in this case, we use Gamma Arabic Sayal. Um, there is also another quality, which is Gamma Arabic Senegal, which is basically better because it has a higher quality. So emulsification properties are better. Um, yeah, but Gamma Arabic Sayal is cheaper. So for the industry, it's more, um, yeah, more of a useful effect then. And um, yeah, we kind of related on traditional methods uh, made here at Simrise. So we used the gamma arabic sayal uh, for for this for this research. And um, in terms of scale up, we could easily produce um, more several hundred kgs of of coats of weights. It's possible, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for that. Uh, any other questions, please keep on typing them in to the right side uh, and we'll answer them after the second presentation. And um, this brings me to um, introduction to the um, second presenter today. 
uh, Daniel Miramontes. He is um, a current PhD student uh, within um, uh, Particle Technology Group at Loughborough University, which I lead. Uh, he did his undergraduate degree uh, at University of Surrey in chemical engineering. So he's a chemical engineer from the start. He did a master degree uh, from uh, UCL um, College London, and he's currently uh, doing a PhD on using the membrane emulsification to manufacture at a large scale various organic and inorganic porous and non-porous material. So without any um, further wait, uh, I'm happy for Daniel to start, and I'll switch off the camera. Hello, my name is Daniel Miramonte Subiaga, and I'll be presenting to you uh, the manufacturing of complex phosphate microcapsules by, by a member emulsification. I just want to start off by uh, acknowledging Sandra for her contribution to, to this work, and also my two supervisors, Mariana and Jenny. This project is partially funded by Inca for Health. Um, this particular project sits in the line plant based coosivates, although most of the formulation that I'll see today is uh, the animal based formulation. Uh, this was the pre work to the, to the plant based uh, system. It's an overview. We're going to look at an introduction and motivation to the project. Um, secondly, we're going to look at, with a batch system, an introduction of member emulsification with examples of various parameters that we can adjust to, to control the quality of our emulsions. Um, thirdly, we're going to look at the continuous system uh, for member emulsification. And lastly, we're going to look at the complex quasive microcapsules uh, manufactured using the, the continuous system. So why complex phosphorylation to produce microcapsules? Well, this process yields up to 90% active load and very high encapsulation efficiency. Not only this, but it also offers simplicity, scalability, reproducibility, and high yield of active ingredients. And encapsulation of food ingredient by complex phosphorylation first involves the formation of an oil in water emulsion. Typically, this is done by conventional emulsification methods. Therefore, the quality of the emulsion, and by this I mean the particle size and uniformity, will affect downstream processing. However, the use of membranes to produce emulsions or dispersions offers an alternative that is more attractive due to the energy efficiency of the process. On one hand, we have conventional emulsification methods. These include high pressure systems, stirring vessels, colloidal mills, etc. These generally are very energy intensive processes which suffer from poor risk producibility, poor droplet uniformity, high mechanical stress, and unreliable scale up. On the other hand, we have drop by drop emulsification. These include micro channel emulsification and membrane emulsification. These use less amounts of energy per unit volume and they're able to produce emulsions near or monodispersed size droplets. Uh, they provide a reliable scale-up, and they're quite reproducible. Our batch system consists of a base, a membrane, a glass cell, and an impeller. The membrane sits between the base and the glass cell. This particular membrane, as you can see on the left, has a hexagonal pore arrangement and a distance between pores of about 200 microns, with an average pore size of 5 to 200 micrometers in size, depending on which membrane we're using. The remember emulsification, the dispersed phase, which is our oil phase containing our active ingredients, is pressed through the membrane and is detached into the continuous phase by the shear, which is induced from stirring. The force balance model attempts to predict the droplet size. There are two main forces involved. One is the capillary force and the viscous drag force. The capillary force prevents the droplet from detaching and the viscous drag force detaches the droplet. We have three main parameters that we can vary to achieve a different size of droplet. We have the shear, which is, which is induced by stirring, the interfacial tension, which we can adjust by changing our emulsifier, and the radius of the pores, which we can also change. However, this has some limitations as it does not account for uh, the mass transfer that occurs during droplet detachment. 
and we have to consider this based on the of the detachment time. There are two ways to increase the shear at the surface of the membrane, either by increasing the strain rate, which we already saw, or by adjusting the viscosity of the continuous phase. In this case, we're using a 50 micron membrane, a dispersed phase that's just vegetable oil, a continuous phase that is a solution of gum arabic that varies between two and 20 weight percent, a constant injection rate of five milliliters per minute, and a stern rate of 945 revolutions per minute. On the left, we can see on our y-axis on the left is our droplet diameter, our x-axis is the shear, and our, our secondary y-axis is the viscosity. And we see that as we increase the viscosity, we increase the shear at the surface of the membrane, which leads to a quicker detachment time, which results in the production of smaller droplets. On the right, we see on the y-axis span, which is how we measure uniformity. Um, and on the x-axis is the shear. And we find that we get the most optimal conditions at around a shear of 20 to 25 pascals. In this set of experiments, uh, we're using a 5 micron membrane, the same uh, dispersed phase, and a continuous phase at 20 weight percent gamma arabic, which corresponds to a viscosity of 35 mPa second and an injection rate that varies between 0 0.1 and 7 milliliters per minute, and a stern rate of 1,361 revolutions per minute, which corresponds to around 60 pascals. So on the left side, we can see on a y-axis droplet size as a function of our injection rate. And what we see is that as we decrease the injection rate, uh, the droplet decreases, so we're talking about a mass transfer across the neck, higher injection rate, the longer the droplets will take to detach, and it will allow more mass to get through that, that poor neck. And we also mentioned that this force balance doesn't consider this effect, hence why the droplet size tends, uh, tends towards that theoretical value at lower injection rates. So the less contribution for the mass transfer, the closer to the predicted value. However, this is not the case below one milliliter per minute. We actually see an increase in droplet size. And this is due to the fact that there's pores are being deactivated. So by that deactivation process, the flux is increasing in a single pore, which would be a similar effect to increasing the injection rate. This is also um, visible by the span, which is a lot worse, um, which is not only because of this deactivation, activation of pores, but is also due to the length of time it takes to, to achieve um, our total emulsion concentration. The lower the injection rate, the longer it will take to achieve that specific concentration. So we've seen that we can adjust the shear and the injection rate to achieve um, a smaller or larger droplets. In this case, we're changing the size of the pores, uh, of the pore size. In this case, we're using the same dispersed phase as vegetable oil, a continuous phase of 20 weight percent gum arabic. In this case, the injection rate was fixed at three milliliters per minute, and the stirring rate was fixed also at 1,361, same as before. And we see that by increasing the membrane pore size, we can increase the droplet size, hence uh, a larger capillary force wanting to hold those droplets together. And on the right, we see the uniformity of our emulsion, which tends to stay quite, quite uniform despite, regardless of the pore size. Remember, emulsification process can be scaled up by one of the continuous systems. In this particular case, is the annually cross-flow member emulsification system. Uh, this particular system allows for an increased production rate. We're talking going from 100 milliliters in the batch system to 60 to 100 liters an hour for the continuous system. 
a reduced time to achieve a particular emulsion. And this process limits breakage and coalescence of droplets compared to the batch system, where we're constantly stirring throughout the emulsification process. The system consists of a tubular stainless steel membrane with a 10 millimeter inner diameter and a 100 millimeter active membrane length with a nine millimeter insert rod, flow dividers and receivers at the inlets and outlets of the system to ensure an even distribution of the continuous phase. Uh, the membrane in this case, we're using a 10 micron membrane with a pore spacing of 400 microns. The system is, the principle is similar to that of the batch system. The difference is instead of stirring, we pump the liquid across the membrane to induce that shear on the, on the surface of the membrane. For these set of experiments, we're using, as mentioned before, a 10 micron membrane. The dispersed phase is the same as going to be vegetable oil. Our continuous phase is going to be a varying concentration of gomorabic of 2 and 20 weight percent. The dispersed phase is fixed at 5.3 milliliters per minute. And the continuous phase flow rate was varied between 400 and 1,000 milliliters per minute. And what we're looking at here, same as before, Droplet size against, instead of shear, we're looking at the continuous phase flow rate between 400 and 1,000 milliliters per minute. We're looking at two viscosities, a two weight percent and 20 weight percent. We can see before the same conditions, with different viscosities, we're going to get much, much smaller droplet size for the highest viscosity continuous phase. The uniformity of the droplet at the lowest viscosity appear to be roughly the same regardless of the continuous phase flow rate, whereas for the most viscous system, it tends to, to increase towards higher continuous phase flow rates, potentially due to that to the breaking of, of, those, um, of those droplets as they exit the, the, um, the continuous system. We can express this continuous phase flow rate as shear. And uh, we can actually see that it follows our force balance model quite well. Um, as we increase the shear, we see that, yes, the droplets are smaller. And it does follow that, that trend quite nicely. Um, and we calculate the shear from these two equations down here. If you have more questions about that later, I'm happy to, to respond. But we've explored various parameters we can use to control the emulsion droplet size and uniformity. And now we move on to making coarser microcapsules using this continuous member emulsification system. Um, as we've probably already seen in the previous presentation, but I'll just go over it really quickly. Uh, Coarservation is a process in which phase separation occurs due to the modification of the media environment. In our case, we'll be doing that by adjusting the pH. There are two different types of coarservation. There's simple and complex coarservation. Complex coarservation is a phase separation that occurs due to the ionic interactions between two or more oppositely charged polymers, which are usually proteins and polysaccharides. Uh, we'll be using both gomorabic and gelatin. Um, and this phase separation will occur at the oil-water interface um, allowing the formation of a, of a shell around the interface. But the procedure and the conditions for complex coarservation, we did a few tests at the start. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but one of those was to measure the interface tension of the protein on its own, polysaccharide on its own, and the mixture. And we found that for the mixture, the interface tensions had somewhere in between, which kind of makes sense. But this suggests that both biopolymers are interface active during emulsification. Having them both in or being able to control the emulsion size and uniformity, it just simplifies the process. So we went for that. Um, in terms of the optimal conservation conditions, as we can see, we did this by turbidity analysis at various pH. Uh, in the inset axis, we can see that 
uh, regardless of the pH, we adjusted the individual polymers and polysaccharides, the turbidity did not change, suggesting that they weren't interacting um, at those conditions. Whereas when we mix the gelatin and the gum arabic, and we adjust the pH, we found that we found a highest point at 4.75, which we deemed to have as our complex quasivate um, conditions. So the process first starts with the first step, which is emulsification, which we did by the continuous system. And the continuous system, we have um, a solution of two percent protein and two percent polysaccharides, so gelatin and arabic, and the dispersed phase were, was vegetable oil. After emulsification, we adjust the pH to the aquasivation uh, conditions, and we slowly cool this down. After which, we add the cross-linking agent to to harden the shell. In the effort to increase the stability of the coasivates uh, for spray drying purposes, we will be showing you today three different microcapsules prepared at different total protein to polysaccharide to oil ratios. So by increasing the total amount of protein polysaccharide to oil ratio, we can um, increase the thickness of the shell. We also varied the initial emulsion size to see how that would impact um, the stability of these quasivates. Uh, here you'll see uh, particle size distributions for the emulsion and after uh, complex quasivation and cross-linking with, together with their images of before and after complex quasivation. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, what we see is a shift in the particle size distribution for all of them. Uh, it's more predominant in the first one and the second one compared to that of the third one where it's barely noticeable that shift in, in particle size distribution. Uh, which we can also see here by right? the this increase in in size where we have the highest increase in size for the first microcapsule and it decreases as we go down. Uh, we also see the appearance of a smaller peak at around 10 microns, and in a moment we'll see why. If we look a bit closer, we see that this peak that's appeared at around 10 microns is due to loose shell material that's not part of, of the main coasivate. Um, we also find that the increase in particle size is due to three main factors. One is aggregation, uh, which was found to be highest at the lowest initial motion size. <clears throat> Polysense during stirring Although the process was continuous for the manufacturing of the emulsion or for the production of the emulsion, um, complex quasivation and cross-linking was done in a batch vessel, which was allowed to stir for at least 24 hours. During this period, before the hardening of the shell, those droplets could have very easily coalesced. And of course, because of the shell formation. To conclude, uh, membrane emulsification not only provides a more energy efficient process, but it also a better control over drop size and uniformity compared to those conventional methods. Uh, we've seen that we can produce emulsions with a drop size varying between 23 and 100 microns and a span varying between 0 0.6 and 1.2. Uh, we've also seen a simple scale up of the emulsification system going from the dispersion cell, very small, with a very small volume, to the continuous system uh, at very high uh, production rates. We also successfully produce a variety of microcapsule sizes using the continuous membrane emulsification system with, with a size varying between 124 microns to 139 microns with a span. Uh, of 0 0.75 to 1.29, which compares quite well to the initial emulsion vertical size, as opposed to those conventional emulsification methods, which could lead to span values of higher than two, for example. Uh, if you want to know more about 
these micro capsules and what their stability is like during the spray drying process. We do have a paper coming out soon under this title. Um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I would just like to thank very quickly the EPSRC and the NCAP for Health uh, for funding this project. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Daniel, for, for the follow-up talk after Sandra. Um, and we got uh, quite a few questions uh, on the right side. So we'll start um, uh, first from Sandra. And I'll, I'll, I'll go from the top and probably we'll get more questions for Daniel as we start to answer the questions. So um, there is a first question for Sandra. What happens when you rehydrate your dry conservates? Do you observe some barrier properties as before drying, maybe? Um, this depends on what is meant by barrier properties. So when we check it with the microscope, we still see uh, the capsule or the, the shell around the oil droplet, definitely. Um, and also when it survived um, the spray drying process, the mechanical stability should be still there. Yes. And um, just to follow up on that, um, do you see any changes uh, with the capsule shape after the, the drying itself and after the rehydration, do they get to the similar or close like properties? Mm, yeah, it's close like, but it always depends on the spray drying parameters. I showed at one slide in the presentation a microscope picture of a really deformated um, capsule, and this is because uh, the pro uh, the parameters were maybe too harsh. So there could be a deformation. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, thank you. Very good. There's another question from Victor Bodron. How does tannic acid cross-linking compare to formaldehyde glutaldehyde cross-linking? Mm -hmm. Um, so first of all, formaldehyde, glutaldehyde is a little bit toxic. So this is a difference and, um, yeah, slightly, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's faster in, in, in the cross-linking process. So tannic acid is a little bit slower. Um, yeah, but the same stability. Okay, and I have uh, another one from uh, Alexandra Litlatnikova. What kind of potato pectin has been used, isolate, or was it uh, uh, further purified? Mm, I think it should be potato protein. Um, if so, yeah, we used an uh, isolate one, uh, which was commercially purchased, and I think it's around about 90% protein content. Very good. Mariana? Um, there is also a question how the surface oil levels have been measured. So maybe you can mm. call that one, please. Okay. Um, yeah. So we first of all measured the total amount um, of oil of the spray dried powder with a low resolution NMR. And afterwards, we washed the um, powder with hexane to get rid of uh, the surface oil. And uh, the washed powder was then. Um, again, measured um, with a low resolution NMR and the difference of the powder before minus the um, powder washed um, is then the surface oil divided by the um, uh, the total oil amount. Yes. Very good. Very good. Uh, we have plenty of questions for Sandra, you know. Uh, <laughs> here we are. This is another one, uh, Pedro Garcia Moreno. Yes, the water content of the emulsion fed to the spray dryer is quite high. Mm. Is this economically okay? Is there any possibility to increase the concentration of the biopolymer to form the coacervates or to add any extra encapsulation agent? Yeah, I don't know if it was clear in my presentation that we use for the spray drying process um, also maltodextrin. So we use maltodextrin as a carrier material and also to increase the viscosity because, as you're right, it's absolutely inefficient to try 90% of water. Um, yeah, so yeah, we added maltodextrin. <laughs> Very good. Mariana, do you have another one? Yeah, there is a question from Kelly Stockmo uh, about um, um, the the spray drying itself. So, um, do the spray dry um, form as uniform drops? Do you tend to see some aggregation um, after the spray drying, um, and are they easily uh, redispersed once they are dried afterwards? Mm -hmm. 
yes, they are easily redispersed, um, but oh, there are also some aggregates. Yeah, we can see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that also Daniel connected that it might be also due to the process of the mixing within the vessel prior to, but probably might be also due to the, the spray drying itself. And there's another question. It could be for both of you uh, from Aditya Kandewal. Uh, does the nature of the carrier oil, uh, the vegetable oil, affect the formation of the droplets? Um, yeah, so I'll answer that one. Uh, so definitely the type of oil, like the composition of the oil or different ratios of the monodial triglycerides will affect the, the interfacial tension, which will then affect the, the droplet size of your emulsion. But yes, it definitely matters what type of oil you're using, as well as the, the viscosity of your oil and the difference in the densities and viscosities of your dispersed and uh, continuous phase as well. Makes sense. And Sandra, do you want to respond there? No, I totally agree. Absolutely. Good, good. Uh, Mariana? No, that's fine. Yeah. So here's a question from Maria Victoria from uh, um, Buenos Aires to Sandra. Excellent presentation. Of course it is. What about the cross of a powder um, fluency, so flowability produced mm -hmm. by spray drying? Um, in this case, we didn't measure the flowability, but just from my experience and my the visual uh, my visual op opinion um it was not too bad because we added maltodextrin and maltodextrin is a uh, yeah, component which gives you a little bit of flowability otherwise maybe it would be too bad because then you just have a, lots of oil with uh, less um, um car carrier or polymer content very good and one more for sandra great talk that's from craig Dockham. Uh, could electro spray uh, spray drying provide a solution for drying coasserates? Um, yeah, really interesting question. It always depends on your ingredient, I would say, because um, the cost benefit effect must be there because electrostatic spray drying is uh, expensive. And if you want to have a high march and uh, um, yeah, a high throughput, then maybe it's not the best option. But um, maybe the the shear is not there with electrostatic spray drying, so it could be interesting to try that. Yes. Very good. And then another question. I'd say that's for for you, Sandra, from Singul Ferreira. Thank you for the presentation. How are the capsule morphology, gastric resistance, and core release of the plant-based coasserate capsules? So capsule morphology, I think you answered that, but the, the gastric resistance. Do you want to answer that, Sandra? Or... Yeah, there is a great research ongoing from Katharina, uh, my colleague. Yeah. Do you, do you want to answer it? Yeah, yeah go, go on. Sorry, I think uh, my... Ma Mariana just had to leave. Awesome. Had a... Oh, you, you yeah, can answer Mariana it. Mariana just had to leave. They had a fire alarm in the building. Of course they do, you know. <laughs> uh, so it's just the three of us now. <laughs> um, yes, uh, as it happened, a colleague of Sandra, um, Katarina, came over here uh, into my lab. And that's really our specialty, um, the gastrointestinal stability. Uh, and yes, we tested it. And yes, it depends on the core material and the, on, the, so on the size and on the... Um, on the um, uh, capsule thickness, so it's affected by both. And depending on the uh, structure of the protein, it survives better or, or you know, more or less. Okay, um, now it's just me now. Okay, question to Daniel from Pedro Garcia Moreno. Uh, is it possible to reduce the oil droplet size of emulsions produced by membrane emulsification? And the result uh, showed the size was higher than 20 micrometers uh, yeah so so if you were to produce a motion uh, on your first try it would not be possible to produce uh, droplets are smaller than your your pore diameter sometimes that does happen and that's uh, because of the uh, portuosity of the pore and you know the geometry of the pore and it can happen However, uh, there's a technique where you recirculate your emulsion and you press it through the membrane again. And that is a way to actually reduce the particle size even below that, that membrane pore size. Uh, so yes, you can do that. 
Very good. Uh, another question here, which is the best thickness of membrane uh, uh, in oil, in the oil industries? So, so we so we get our membranes from from micropore. I'm not quite sure what optimal thickness is. Um, maybe if you message me, I can tell you how thick are the membranes we use are, but I don't I have no idea on the top of my head how thick they are. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Very good. There's another question from Rosen Ramizani uh, about the uh, um, uh, gastric stability. And I think that was answered, it really depends on the material. Marina Aishon, who is a secondi from the same EU project, and again for Sandra, how successful was the dyeing of the pectin and were the confocal images produced? And could pectin be clearly distinguished from the potato, uh, from the, from sorry, from the protein or from the potato protein? So how 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 was the, okay. uh, um... the, the dyeing of the pectin achieved? Was it mm -hmm. efficient? Um, yeah, it was kind of efficient, maybe a little bit too much. Um, we didn't do any confocal microscope pictures here at Simrise, but I know that Katarina did them um, at uh, Andre's side. And um, yeah, it was, we couldn't distinguish between uh, pectin and, and protein then, yeah. Very good. Um, a question to both of you. From the industrial point of view, which is a maximum reactor size? Um, so if we're talking um, member emulsification, at least it is uh, for the batch member emulsification, that small cells are around 100 milliliters. But the continuous system was maybe was about 10 centimeters in length and one centimeter in diameter. I don't know what other... Um, size reactors there are, but if you check the micropore uh, web page, I think they have a lot more information than what I can give you on that. That's right, yeah. And just Is to there... just to continue that question really quickly. So the 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 batches of the experiments were around three kilograms. Um in order to produce that amount with member emulsification that took around three minutes compared to emulsifying for around 30 to an hour using a conventional system if that gives you more information. Very good. And I have one last question that's from uh, Laura Hamida, again from Buenos Aires, for Daniel. When you obtain coacervates in the continuous flow conditions, do you necessarily end up with a batch cross-linking? Uh, cross-link, yes. So yes, that is, um, uh, yeah, unfortunately, the, the production of the motion is continuous, but the cross-linking step is batch. Um, at least for now, you can always couple the continuous system to another continuous system where you actually inject your uh, your cross-linker, and that will be a way to actually scale it up uh, continuously. Uh, but yeah, in this case, it was definitely batch. Um, so yeah. Okay, excellent. We have a few more questions, but uh, I'd say we stop now because we really have to finish at, at three o'clock here, uh, Irish time. If you have any question, either contact the people directly, the speakers directly, or the video is on YouTube. Just type type the question on YouTube and you, Sandra and uh, Daniel, keep an eye on it and you can answer it if, if you wish. Okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, thank you both for the preparation of the presentation. Very good. Um, Mariana, so she sent me a photo from, uh, from outside the building. Well, I'm glad that we don't have a fire alarm here. Uh, so we had about 110 attendants here on, on Zoom and about 20 on, on YouTube. Uh, as I said, we leave the, um, um, the presentation on YouTube for eternity. So I just want to remind you that the project itself is in Cup for Health is a Marie Curie RISE project with uh, a number of academic partners but also industry, which is kind of interesting, you know, Sunrise, CP Calco, Anabiotechnology here in Ireland, Saboriti, and uh, of course, Micropore and uh, NCAP process. And uh, uh, we've seen that two questions came from Latin America mm -hmm. as well. So it's really uh, across the Atlantic is, is very good. Um, so we are um, planning to have a few more webinars. So follow us on the LinkedIn group, uh, Micro Encapsulation, and we will announce it uh, there. 
the uh, YouTube channel itself is uh, uh, is quite active. So there are a number of webinars on it as well, uh, already. So uh, um, have a have a look at the channel. It's a very good um, a good tool to learn something on microencapsulations. So that's all I want to say. Uh, thank you again and goodbye.